Welcome to another edition of Wake Up the Echoes presented by TireRack.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone. Happy to be back after one week off. Thanks again to Charlotte for filling in on the women's basketball show last week. She did a great job chatting with Coach Ivy and that team. Happy to be back this week to talk to head coach Micah Shrewsbury again about the men's team. It's been actually a month or so since we had a chance to catch up with him, so we really covered a lot about what's happened on the floor over the course of the last month. A little bit later in the show, we had a chance to sit down with one of the local products, J.R. Konezny, and also talk to assistant coach Ryan Owens. Additionally, at the very end, because it is a 50-year anniversary of maybe the most impressive victory in the history of college sports, Notre Dame knocking off UCLA, ending their 88-game win streak. Hard to believe it was 50 years ago. We talked to Dwight Clay, who hit the big shot in that game. Just an awesome conversation with him about really everything that happened during the game, uh, the moments on the floor when they stormed the floor after, even a standing ovation at South Dining Hall. I won't give away what his favorite dining hall is, but okay, I, I did just give it away. You might have an idea. Just a great conversation with him about everything that transpired 50 years ago. So, a jam-packed show. Let's not waste any time. Let's talk to the head coach, Micah Shrewsbury. Okay, coach, we're back. It's been like, I think, a month since we did this show. I, I know you've seen plenty of me before and after the, the basketball game, so you, you don't miss me, but have you missed sitting in the plush leather couches doing this recap, or you've been okay without it? No, I've definitely missed it. I, I think just um, uh, I I do, you know, miss sitting here chatting with you, mm-hmm. but uh, probably just the 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 maybe the fan interactions. You know, yeah. hopefully we'll get more of those as we go through here. But, yeah, uh, you know, I'm sure they have missed me. <laughs> no taste test this week, by the way. No. Uh, No Coke taste test, but let's recap because for people that listen to this show and don't maybe necessarily follow week by week, a lot's happened since the last time we talked. This will be the last time I ask you about the Citadel game, but it just seems like since that game, which was a low point, you guys have looked like a different and more consistent team. Even in the losses, there's been a certain baseline level of whether it's compete, effort, effectiveness. What have you seen? What's the biggest change been that you've seen since that game? Because it does seem like a page was flipped after that. Yeah, I think right after that game, we we really talked about um, coming together more as a group, okay. um, building more trust, more accountability as a group, and I think that's kind of translated to the court. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're we're starting to trust each other a little bit more. You can see it, you know, as it's coming through on on the defensive end. Um, and then guys just holding each other accountable about, you know, doing their job, folks on doing their job, and then, you know, trying to get other guys to do the same thing. Yeah. And when we see it, like, say something about it. Hmm. Don't take it personal. Like, we're all just out here for one goal, and that's to to come together and win. Yeah. The Maybe the best example was then Virginia. I think 11 days later, you guys, that was probably the best win of the year to beat that team, I think it's the stat was it's the largest margin of victory in conference against Virginia since 2017, and they've been a pretty good team since 2017. So in that game in particular, what was the thing that stood out to you? What were you most impressed with from your group? I think just the, you know, that was our first game after Christmas break, mm-hmm. and we came back from Christmas break and had some really good practices leading into that. Mm-hmm. Like just great enthusiasm, great joy in in our preparation which led to how we played and we played the same exact way now you know we really guarded them like we we really did a great job of of taking away what they wanted to do and some of their strengths and then you know sometimes like you need a little luck too right like uh we started the game making a couple threes jr hit a couple threes that was open that were great reads from our group but then like you bank one in right like at the at the shot clock and and like those are shots you're not counting on going into the game, but when you make them, you're like, oh, okay. Like things are, there's a pretty good chance things can go our way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, but you, we earned luck. Yeah. With how we prepared, with how we played, the effort we played with. We earned the right to, to get the ball to bounce our way a couple of times. Uh, JR's our guest this week, and I am going to ask him, I want to ask him about the 
it, it technically, I guess, like an alley oop three. Like he caught the ball in midair and fired off the glass. I want to ask him what was going through his head when he put that one in. Marcus in this game, 15 points, but I, I thought the eight assists is what really jumped out to me. If you have eight assists against Reese Beekman in that defense, you're figuring something out. He just gets better, I think, every month that goes by. What impressed you from Marcus in that game, and what have you seen now, what, a couple months into his career that's been really encouraging? Yeah, I, I think in that game he he just kind of took what the defense gave him okay, and uh, just constantly just made the right play, mm-hmm. whether that was him scoring, whether that was him – uh, passing the other guys, I think that like was one of the games where everything really kind of slowed down for him. Mm-hmm. And each game is different, right, for him. And it, it's a lot as a freshman to, you know, to ask him to make reads at a high level mm-hmm. um, when he's played, you know, at that point in time, maybe like twelve or thirteen games, yeah. um, right? Like it takes time, right? There, there are really good players in this league that have struggled as freshmen. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really good pre- freshmen that have played great, you know, but it's not without struggles. Yeah. I think everybody goes through them. So he's learning. He's, you know, getting put into the fire each and every game, um, but he's learning and getting better through it, and he's he's kept a great attitude um, all the way through it as well. Yeah. The next two, NC State and Duke, you know, now there's some time away from those games Obviously, there's some stuff at the end of the game I'm sure you've coached, and if you make a couple plays here or there, maybe the results are different. But still, to compete on that level, to me, those two games gave me, as someone that watches you guys night in, night out, real belief that any ACC game, pretty much any venue too, and we'll talk about Georgia Tech in a second, you guys are going to compete and be there at the end. What did those games teach you, and what were your kind of your messages after those two losses in games you guys very well could have won? Yeah, for us, you know, for a team like – you know, we're not as talented as all the other ACC teams mm-hmm. right, right now. Right. We're not. Um, so our margin for error is really small. Mm-hmm. And the NC State game was one where I think our rebounding and our free throws came back to hurt us. Mm-hmm. Right. You just can't give those possessions up and expect a win. Right. Like, you, you got to maximize everything. And, you know, like, we don't have to be perfect, but – um, our efforts got to be perfect, and then like we can't give the other team opportunities. And I thought in both games we did that. Yeah. Um, you know, but we gave ourselves a chance, and I think that's the the biggest thing. And that like even when you lose games like that, which um, I hate losing, right? Which has <laughs> clearly been talked about, uh, and everybody knows that I hate losing. But you can you start to get a little bit of buy-in and belief from the guys to say, wow, if we do things the right way, if we play this way, like we're going to have a chance. We're going to have a chance to win each and every game, no matter who the opponent is. And um, that's, you know, for us, something to build off of. Even though we've gotten better since that Citadel game, we've been in more games. Uh, We haven't gotten the results that we wanted. Yeah. Um, but we're getting buy-in and we're getting belief that if we do things the right way, we'll we'll give ourselves a chance. I think the best example is the next game at Georgia Tech because even though you didn't get the results at home, you were really close, and then it finally broke through at Georgia Tech. For you, to get the first road win, to get it in overtime because uh, Dongo throws in a three at the end that was kind of a, a Hail Mary, what did that tell you? How important was it just to get a win like that on the road in overtime? For us, it was big. Um you know, obviously because it was a road game. It's hard mm-hmm. to win on the road. But uh, kind of our resolve after he made that shot, right? We we overdid it a little bit defensively. Sure. Um, we are a, like, always foul up three team. I was going to ask you about right? your philosophy. Okay. That's like I'm doing it every okay. single time. But the situation didn't dictate that because of the time on the time of the clock, right? Okay. Like, So what's your threshold then? I would love to tell you that, but I will not. Oh, okay, yeah, We sure. have a time. We okay. have a time. You have a time. And we that have was a beyond time. the time hole. Okay. It was beyond the time, right? Okay. I, I want to say there were 16 seconds left Okay, when they got the ball. If we would have gotten to our time Undisclosed frame, time, yeah. Then we would have fouled. Interesting. Um, but it also, with a young team, they may have a lot of chances to work on it, right? Mm-hmm. We haven't been in that position in a game. You do it in practice, but it's been a really long time since we've practiced it. So, like – even though, like, 
like we're always trying to win, right? But we also are trying to learn through those situations. So like just having this long break here, um, it allowed us to work on some things that may come up that we'll be better at in yeah. these situations. So, but you know, I love the way that we responded in overtime after like, you know, it's just, it's such a, a gut punch when something like that happens, but our guys bounce back pretty quickly. And I think we held them to two points in overtime. Mm -hmm. Braden had a great game, 25, I think it was 25 points, knocked down a bunch of threes just to see him break out that way shooting it really well now over the last, I'd say, month of the season. Just what kind of dynamic does that add to your team, and how reassuring is it to see it? Because when a shooter's not shooting well, I think usually coaches say, just keep shooting, they're going to go in. And then when they finally start going in, it has to kind of put everyone at ease, right? Yeah, he, he did play. Um, you could see it leading into that game of, of how confident he was. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that was in, in shoot-around that day and in warm-ups. Like, you could see – how confident he was shooting the ball in that arena. Um, but he had made shots leading into that, right? He'd made some against Duke. Duke. He'd made, you know, one against Virginia, made a couple against NC State. So, like, he's starting to get a little bit more comfortable, um, you know, for what – how slow he started. Like, he's not a 29% three-point shooter or whatever he right. was, right? Like, at some point in time, water finds its level. Right, and yeah. water's finding its level a little bit as as we've gone, and he's gotten more comfortable. So, I, th I think it just adds a little bit more. Um, it's just another guy that they have to worry about. Right, takes a little bit of pressure off Marcus, um, where it's not all on him or Jr. Or, or Tay or whoever it may be. So, um, just gives us a little more firepower from somebody else that now they have to worry about three to four different guys and what they can do. So. Um, you know, hopefully this starts us and kick starts us and starts to add a, a little bit more, um, a little bit more things that we can do offensively to help us. Can I ask about the locker room, the post game in Atlanta? What's the dance? What was going on there? It looked really fun. I, I that, that's where I miss being in a, on a team environment. It looked like you're having a good time in there. How was that? You know what? Our guys, man, they, they, they just work so hard, mm -hmm. right? Like you got to make your hard work fun. And you gotta enjoy what you're doing, and like just the joy that that those guys had on their faces, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it's, you know, something that that's fun for all of us. So, um, yeah, I, I always say we're gonna celebrate winning because winning's hard. Yeah, <laughs> winning's hard. Like it, as easy as it looks, sitting on this couch right here or sitting on the couch at home, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Like there, there are two teams out there that are trying to win, mm -hmm. and um, there are coaches that are that are trying to game plan, and there are players that are trying to disrupt what what you're doing. Like, and you don't win the same way every single time. You don't lose the same way every single time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, winning winning's really hard. And when you get an opportunity to win, when you get a chance to win on the road, like you got to celebrate all of those opportunities, and uh, that's what we're gonna do. We're yeah. gonna, we're gonna celebrate. I have a very random question, but it's been something that just has been in my head really the last month when I watch pregame. What are the head coaches doing from like 90 on the clock to four minutes when you shake hands? Because I see the assistants out there, and I've just thought of this, like I never see the head coaches. So what, what are you guys doing? I know you watch the challenge between shoot around and the game. Yeah. You're not, what are you doing from 90 on the clock until you come out there? Yeah, it, it's changed You know, now. Like I, I'm still trying to develop my routine. Okay here um my spaces like where i go during that time once i get to the arena like once i walk in like whether i'm in the locker room for times whether i'm outside like i'm still figuring that stuff out okay um, but like i usually when i get there i go in and write write up kind of the on the board like our, our pre-game talk of what we're doing okay um what we're going to talk about like our game plan just reinforcing everything uh, spend a lot of that time there, and then, right? There's a lot of dead time too. That's what I'm curious about because a lot, you know, I've I've finished everything. Yeah. All right. So uh, I usually don't come over. I don't I don't head to the locker room until about you know less than sixty minutes on the clock. Right. We okay. we meet with our team at about forty minutes. They yeah. come back to the locker room. So 
I usually don't come over that early, right? I, I don't have like a space. I don't have an office there. Where so, I'm, so you're at, the, where at I'm Ross. Talking. So I'm at Ross. Okay. Yeah. Um, so kind of finishing up last minute game stuff, thinking about what I want to talk about, like the emphasis that, you know, of how to get our team going and everything else. And then do the pregame talk. They go and warm up. There's like, you know, another 10 to 12 minutes of dead time. So. And you're just sitting there alone. You're sitting there alone, man. And, and I, I enjoy being alone. Okay. But, um, you know, there's a lot of, like, a lot of stuff going through. You're you're thinking through the game. You're, okay. like, dreaming scenarios. We're thinking about the first play of the game. You're thinking about how we're going to stop this. You're thinking about substitutions, right? You really wish that there was less time so you're not thinking about all those things. That's what I've you always wanted. You could just wondered. go and play. Yeah, because I see because the assistants come out and they're working with guys. And, they're you know, th- their job is to kind of get everyone locked in. Yeah. And it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm always like, the head coach is back there. Doing something, and I guess like you said, yeah. but you're you're not cramming for a test. Like you're I think you've been thinking about the game like for over, a while, right? Like <laughs> yeah. you know, the preparation's over at that point in time. <laughs> if if you still like, if I'm still trying to get our guys like, hey, this play is going to be this. Like if I got to tell late. them about some play, it's way too late. <laughs> like it's they're scoring on that. So, um, I, you know, I've I've come out. Every once in a while, onto the court, yeah, like during warm ups okay. and do some things, but um, but then people come and talk to you as well, mm. right? So that's why I don't I don't come out as much. Sometimes I just want to sit and just in a different place and watch our guys, watch the other team warm up. But sure. like people come over and talk to you during that time, and that's like kind of like a you want to wind down, right. you want to get ready for the game, and like. Get your mind off everything, so that's why I, I stay back okay. in the locker room. I, I like people though. Yeah, yeah like for I, sure. I, you want to be approached, but there's a time, time there, and place. Yeah, there is a time <laughs> and a place. Yes. <laughs> Last one I got for you before we take our first break is just about kind of the time that it is in the year right now. Whenever January rolls around, I always see the highlights of Notre Dame and UCLA. I could not believe that uh, it's the 50 year anniversary. So neither of us were alive when that big win took place in 1974. But I. I grew up and knew all about it, I assume. You grew up and knew all about it. That game, obviously now that you're the head coach of Notre Dame, it probably has even more significance to you. But thinking about growing up, what it meant, I was going back and like reading the game log and watching the highlights. I mean, like Bill Walton, John Wooden, yeah. it, just what UCLA meant at the time, what Notre Dame was able to do. <laughs> just what does that game signify to you now that you are the head coach at Notre Dame? Yeah, it, it's – it reinforces a lot of things for me, right? Like, um, being from Indiana and you know about Notre Dame, but sometimes you don't know about the history Mm -hmm. and you don't dig into it, right? Unless you have a, unless you have a reason to, right? right? Um, but once you get here and now I'm a part of it and to go back and look at the history of this place, Mm -hmm. Um, and recognize some of the great accomplishments that have happened here you know, on the basketball scene. And, you know, that's right up there near the top. Yeah. Right? Like, that's – it's such a special moment for those guys. And and I know for them, um, you know, the 50-year 50, 50 anniversary, it's almost like the, the Dolphins, like, undefeated – regular season or yeah. whatever where they you know when when the team 72. loses yeah. and then they they pop the champagne bottle and they all celebrate <laughs> like that was such like 88 games like how long that was and how invincible that UCLA team was then to be down and to have like just the 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 just the intensity to, to come back, the togetherness that it took to come back, um, to get it all the way back and then to hit that shot uh, yeah. to win it. Then have to get a stop at the end too. And pray Bill Walton misses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that. That's it, It's it's unreal. Like um, I've gotten a chance to talk to some of those guys. Yeah. And, um, just the pride that they have in their team, their teammates, but in Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And they're paying attention to what we're doing, and that let, like that makes me happy that those guys are they still care about Notre Dame, mm-hmm. still care about Notre Dame basketball, and all we're trying to do is do our best to just make those guys proud. 
Coach, appreciate it. We'll take a break, and we'll bring in J.R. Kinesny. All right, we're joined now by local guy, J.R. Kinesny. J.R., thanks for taking the time. Uh, we got a lot we're going to get to, but I hear you're coming from Italian class. Yes, that's right. Okay. Tony Simeone, uh-huh. Italian. I know how to ask for chocolate ice cream. <laughs> that's about it, honestly. It's it's a real blind spot in my my lineage. Can you tell me something in Italian? Um, I can tell you. All right, yeah. Um, mi chiamo uh, J.R. Kinesny. Um, yo gioco a uh, pellecanestro. Um, my name is Jr. I, I play, play basketball. basketball. Yeah, yeah. Un go. gelato, chocolato, por favore. <laughs> si. <laughs> <laughs> One chocolate ice cream, please. That's si. I, I went to Italy si. when I was like I was... nine, and I just ordered. You know, <laughs> said, if you ask for it in Italian, you can get it. So, I got chocolate ice cream all the time. There you go. Uh, it's our Yeti coldest moment of the week segment. So we always have someone on ask about their coldest moment. I want to ask you. I'll ask. Actually, no, I'm gonna ask Coach first, okay. and then I'll see what you think. But what do you think Jr.'s coldest moment of the season? so far is mm-hmm. i have one in mind but i'll let you guys go first and see where we end up that's a, that's a good uh that's a good one like he's got a couple of, of like reject ball screen kind of baseline drive dunks mm-hmm. <laughs> that were like you know pretty pretty rally uh get the crowd pretty fired up mm-hmm. with like that could be a coldest moment okay. but um i gotta say the the chest pass three, probably the coldest moment. That was mine. I was going with that. <laughs> What's yours, JR? Is that- yeah, um, that's the that's the first one that came to mind. And then, like, kind of thinking about it, um, I think, like, the free throws versus Oklahoma State, I think those kind of – I think, I don't know, like, personally for me, just, like, watching, like, Final Four games or, like, watching, like, March Madness games, like, seeing, like, the guys come, go up and hit, like, the big free throws at the end of the games. I don't know. That's always been like yeah. something that's like meant a lot to me. So I don't know. I like that. I, I yeah. think free throws get overlooked sometimes as being cold, but they can really. I mean, they determine games, like yeah, you said. Definitely, uh, definitely, definitely. Cold blooded moment. Right cold cold blooded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Yet he's go. loving this segment right now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, okay, so when you get to the line late in the game, do, like, what does it feel like? Are you more nervous? Is the heart rate higher? Because I always see too, like when guys go to huddles before media timeouts, coming out that under four, I always think. If they're shooting free throws, it's gonna their percentage is not gonna be what it is. Like there's a lot that goes into late game free throws. What goes through your head when you're at the strike late? Yeah, you know, um honestly, like towards like like in like the late game moments, I kind of feel like this like calmness hmm. kind of come over me. And it's like it's like weird. Like I don't really know how to describe it, but it's kinda like everything else just kinda gets like blocked out. And it's just like you and like the basket and the basketball, and you're just like, All right, like this is it right here. Like I just gotta I gotta like just like follow the routine, follow muscle memory and all that stuff. So Trust your training. Exactly. Yeah. Trust it. Yeah. Coach, how, this is what I'm curious about because we've talked about free throws a little bit and you've had them shooting free throws end of game. <laughs> you can't simulate what that's like, though, when you're either in a hostile environment. Sometimes I think it's harder to shoot them at home because everyone's just kind of so anxious mm-hmm. and nervous. What can you do as the coach to help them prepare for any of that? Or is there just nothing you can do? you got to get in those moments and just figure it out. Yeah, I, th- I think a lot of that is just being in the moment mm-hmm. and, and trying to make them. We do a couple things that – these guys love it. <laughs> this thing is called 16 free 16 throws in five minutes. Okay. Um, so it's just five minutes on the clock. You know, if we're we only we can only do it in Ross because there's five baskets. Okay. But you split to a basket, you shoot, shoot a one one. All right. And the clock love, as soon as we I say go, the, the clock is moving at five minutes. You gotta get sixteen makes in that five minutes. But if you miss the first you got to down back, down back. If you miss a second, you got to down back, right? So, like, the clock is constantly moving. Yeah. And, like, you got to step to the line. You got to make them. But there's also people at your basket. Wow. So, like, there could be three guys at a basket, and, like, you make two, and then you got to get back in line. Right. And there's two other guys shooting, so that time is, like, man, these free throws are really important here. And, like. Make them while you're tired, too. You got to make them while you're tired. You got to, like, sometimes you'll – somebody will miss and they'll take off running. You could be third in line. You might hear open basket and you just take off sprint and go find the open basket. <laughs> that last minute. Just so you can get – yeah, the last minute's chaos. Chaos, yep. <laughs> so are you going through your routine when this is happening or are guys kind of speeding through their routines to get this done? Oh, guys are definitely speeding through their routines. Okay. Definitely, definitely. Okay. It starts off, like, kind of calm, like, for sure. And then it's like, all right, I have eight makes with, like, two minutes to go. It's like, all right, I'm halfway there. 
we have less than half the time left. And I was just like, all right, let's just let's just get through as quick as we can. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, JR, about just your path here. This is your third year on campus. You grew up in the area. But first two years, I mean, you know, redshirted last year, didn't play much as a freshman. So you hadn't played a lot of competitive hoops in a while. Just what was it like to get back on the floor, play in big games, do something that you've been really looking forward to for a long time? Yeah, you know, it's um is that it's been it's been different this year from the past few years, that's for sure. Um yeah, I've definitely been having like a lot more fun, like finally back like, being out there and playing. Sure. You know, it's, it's it definitely took me like a few games to kind of like get like comfortable like playing like co- like playing like the, at the college level and like the pace of the game is so much different. Like you'll go through practice and you'll be like playing like your butt off and then you get into the game and it's like that even gets taken to like another notch. Just like yeah. the different like speed, the different pace of the game and all that. But Nah, it's been it's been great. It's been uh, it's been learning, you know, Coach Shrews and all the other coaches. You know, they've been they've been doing a great job, you know, like getting me like more comfortable into my role and all that, and playing like freely and loosely out there. Yeah. And I, I've I've been having a great time. So yeah, it's been fun to watch, Coach. I know we've talked earlier in the year too, but you brought in a lot of new faces. But it was important to keep a couple guys around that you know. Obviously, Jair's a local guy. Just when you had a chance to keep him, have him be a part of this team, how important was that to have him be a part of this group this year? Yeah, I think he brings a lot to the table, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for you know, being a guard at his size, right? Um, being able to score in different ways, whether that's you know being confident, making threes, driving the ball to the basket, stopping shooting pull ups over people in the paint, mm-hmm. like he gives us a different element and different ways that he can score. Um, but the one thing about Jr. and our staff will talk about it all the time. He just he just brings a joy every single day. Yeah, right, and like. Um, student love he he loves playing basketball. Yeah, and and he's having fun doing it. And like when you see that, like it just takes you back to like, man. Sometimes like, why are we playing? And you know, we play because we love it. And we started a long time ago. And like, Jr. brings you back to like, man, like when you were a kid when you first picked that ball up and you started playing, the joy that you had when you did it. Yeah, and um. Uh, like you, you know, we love coaching guys that have that joy. Yeah, and like he he brings that joy on a daily basis. Where's that come from, Jr.? Because I don't say a lot of people do this, but it is easy for that joy to go away sometimes. Have it feel like an obligation thing you have to go to. Feels like homework practice doesn't always have to be fun. Like where does that joy come from that you're able to bring that every day? Yeah, you know, it's just um, it's just always like basketball's always been like a way for me to kind of like escape like reality in a way. Like if I would, if I would like, if I'm having a bad day, if I'm just like hanging out at home, and I'm just like, yeah, like I just need to like go to the gym and just like get out of like my head of like things that are going on outside of like basketball, I guess. And um, yeah, I just um, yeah, it just gives me like the sense of like being free and like I can go out there and just kind of like do what I want to do. It's kind of like an art form, really. Like you get to go out there like perfect your craft every single day, yeah. and like you really have to like love the work to like love basketball I think so like I love like going out there practicing like getting better every day trying to get like trying to become like the best version of myself I can be yeah and I think like doing that on the basketball court helps me outside of that as well so you mentioned one of the parts of practice you like which is the five minute free throws everyone's racing out <laughs> I don't know if anybody likes it <laughs> okay okay <laughs> they like it when they when they make their 16. yeah that, everyone's watching everybody else throwing <laughs> it afterwards they're like I like match. this okay. I like this a lot okay what are practices like? Because I talked to Marcus. I think he was our first guest. Mm-hmm. He said he called his mom week one. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to make it, Mom. What's it been like for you this year? Because, again, you've got a bigger role, and there's a new coaching staff. I've heard they're intense. Just what's it been like for you? Um, yeah, it's been an adjustment for sure. And, um, you know, that intensity comes with, you know, we know that it's, like, all love at the end of the day. You know, they just want us to, to get better, and they want us to, like, trust and believe, like, the process and all that stuff. And um, it's definitely been different, like, the past, like, the past years for sure. You know, like the intensity side, and like the defensive aspect of everything and stuff. And um, you know, I never really like thought of myself as like a defensive player before. But like after like working through everything like, and practice and all that stuff, and then like seeing like your your practice like come to results, yeah. like in games and all that stuff. Like seeing that we're ranked like top fifty in the country like defensively, like that means a lot, especially with like the work that we've been putting in all that stuff. And it's all like a, it's kind of like formed like a, on a basis of trust. You know, like everyone has to like buy in and trust each other and right. communicate and all that stuff. So. Okay, that, that takes me to an interesting follow-up I have for both of you because I defense, like, I see what they've done at Virginia, and I'm just like, I'm always really, really impressed by what Tony Bennett's done because he gets guys to play there, and they know that their stats are going to be depressed because of that. It's just, it's just the way it's going to be. 
So if when you commit to defense, I always think like in the back of my head, coach, people are saying, well, if I'm going to give all this effort on defense, one, my offense is going to struggle. And two, as a team, like we're just as a result, like all of our numbers are going to come down. How do you get buy in defensively from a team? And how has this team done that? Because the defense, like you said, it's been outstanding this year. Like, how do you do that? How do you get a group to buy in that way? Yeah, I I think, um, you know, there's different ways of winning. Hmm. Right. You have to find the best way for your team to win. Okay. And I don't know, if you look at the two years at Penn State, our first year, our defensive side was really good. And then last year, we were solid, but our offense was really good. Right. Right. And that it was just how your team was built. Um, you got like, there's not one way to win. And I don't think I'm ever going to do things the same way. Okay. Like, I just want to win. So whether it's offense first, whether it's defense first, Whatever fits that group, that's how we're going to try and win. So, um, you know, winning speaks to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, that's the uh, the one thing is like, you know, we're always going to put in max effort. Yeah. Right. Because we got to give ourselves a chance. Um, but like, if we can give ourselves a chance, then that's all we want at the end of the day. So uh, I think everybody enjoys winning. Yeah. You know, I always, you know, winning's better than losing. So, like, if we give ourselves a chance to win, I'd, I'd rather do that than score a bunch of points and look good. Lose like, by 20, yeah. And lose by 20, right? Yeah. You said you never saw yourself as a defensive player. So then how have you maybe surprised yourself defensively this year when you've maybe learned some things about your game you didn't know you had in you? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, um, Coach always talks about this as, like, discipline and, like, sticking to, like, that discipline every single day. And, um I guess a lot of it has been just like certain like ball read coverages and like on the ball defense. Like I would say like being on the ball and like working through like different like ices like on the ball screens or like switches or like veers and all that stuff. Like I I, I was never able to really like comprehend like what was going on. Like I would have an understanding, but then like to like understand it and then go out into the court and like do that or like two different See things. Work. Yeah. So like they've been able to like teach it in a way where like it's, you can understand it and then like you're going out there and like you're doing it every single time and like, um, yeah, um, I guess just like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, repetitions, like all that stuff. It, it just, it, it, it just, you do it over and over again, and it starts to become a, a habit. So yeah. yeah, it's been fun to watch you guys defend. I, th- I think too, it's like it's fun to watch teams lock in defensively. Like you said, it's not all about like what the mm-hmm. what the score bug says and where the points are. You can have a lot of fun on defense. I want to ask you about playing in your backyard. Like you obviously grew up near here. How fun is it to play so close to home? Oh, it's a lot of fun for sure. And, um, you know, being able to see my family after games and being able to drive up to St. Joe and watch Chase play and watch Nick play and yeah. watch St. Joe play has been has been great. And um, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, being so close to home, you know, I can go home whenever I want to, get like a little home-cooked meal and all that stuff, sleep in my bed, like get a little nap in if I need to. But, yeah, the Sundays are usually like the days I go home and I'm just like chilling there for like a little bit. But um, yeah, that's big. Like when it's yeah. cold, that <laughs> sounds so nice. <laughs> yeah. you know, when you can go home and it's cold, that sounds so nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm really, I'm really like blessed and fortunate to to be so close and have this opportunity. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just grateful. Coach, yeah. we, we've talked about obviously Marcus's impact, but like you think about Blake, who was here a couple of years ago, who I know you're tight with, and Demetrius. There's just something about the guys that, I mean, it's probably true for any school, but I just being around here, the guys that grew up in the backyard, it's so valuable to have them not just on the team but now jr like getting on the floor and playing just from your eyes how neat is it to see him having the success he is so close to home yeah i, I think it's special um that you know for for these guys that to be young kids um yeah. and see it and watch it and now really kind of dream about what it would be like and now to be a part of it like see all of your hard work coming to fruition and yeah. um that there there is just there's just an energy and a vibe that like you know the people of South Bend they they love their own mm-hmm. right because they've had a chance to see Jr. or Marcus or Demetrius or Blake or they they've seen these guys watch them throughout their careers and now you know they get more years of getting a cheer for them right here um, which is it, it's fun for me like I that's. You know, I I usually zone out in games, but like one of the things that that's really cool to me is like when they do the starting lineups, yep. and and you know, I I do always pay attention um, when they announce Jr. and Marcus because like 
the the our fans appreciate who these guys are. They've seen them grow up, and they're growing up before their eyes, right? Yeah. And even now, and there's still more to come from them. Um, and they probably don't appreciate it now, but like the the family aspect, um, it is. It's something that, you know, I'm getting a, a chance and I'm not home. You know, I'm two hours or whatever from home. But, like, yeah, my parents being here and being around and, and seeing my family a lot, like, these guys don't – they appreciate it. But when they As look you get back older, on it, yeah. when they get older, they're going to be like, man, that was really cool that that my family was able to, to really be a part of this whole experience. Yeah. Do you get chills when they announce your name for lineups? Yeah, I do. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because you mentioned that it's like I, I'm doing the broadcast, getting ready, and I, every time you know when Jr. or Marcus are getting announced because there's just a different, there's a different buzz. All right, last one. Just what excites you about the future, the rest of this season? What are you looking forward to last month and a half of this season? Um, we have a bunch of young guys that are hungry to prove everybody wrong. And I think that's the that's the biggest thing I can really say, honestly, is that we're in here every day working our butts off, and um, we're gonna go out there and compete every single every single day, every single night that we have a game. So yeah, yeah. All right, thanks for coming by. Uh, grazie. <laughs> <laughs> Arrivederci. Ah, there we go. All right. See you again. All right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Arrivederci. <laughs> All right, we're joined by a special guest, <laughs> assistant coach Ryan Owens. Uh, I want to start here, actually. I just heard, I didn't know this, nickname's Ghost? Oh, yeah. Why, why is your nickname Ghost? You know what? Uh, one of my best friends named Justin uh, and Travis, Travis Trice, you might remember his name. He played at Purdue with yeah. Butler. He had some sons that played at Wisconsin, one played at Michigan State. And uh, he had two twins, daughters as well. And he said, I wasn't coming over to hang out with them. I was just trying to sneak around and see his twin daughters, named <laughs> Reagan and Megan. He called me a ghost and it stuck from there. Really? Yeah. So you've just been going by ghost ever since? Ever since about sixth grade. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, about sixth grade. Dang. Majority of people in Indiana call me ghost. All right. I'm going to call you ghost now. Please do it. Can I? Okay. Please do it. You know, when you hear your nickname, it automatically releases positive endorsements <laughs> to start off the conversation. <laughs> so I'm a big nickname guy. All right, I got another icebreaker we usually do with people here. You're probably in the right age demo for this, not to make yeah. you feel old. But I always feel old coming on this show, talking to the young guys. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure you, you got tons of players that make you feel old. And one mixtape. Yeah. Who was your guy when that was coming out? Oh, the big brother. Escalade? Escalade. Mm-hmm. I was about to say Cadillac. I'm <laughs> glad you cleaned me up. I'm glad you cleaned me up. Yeah, Escalade, that was my guy. I was just amazed at his skill set for moving so big. Yeah. These young guys, so big. they come in, they, they're like, oh, that's like the thing. I've seen some of that, but I don't know, yeah. you know, maybe like yeah. professor. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. well, there's all yeah. kinds of guys. Like Skip to my Lou, they didn't even know he played in the NBA. All right. Like, yeah. yeah, mad game. He was great. Yeah. Had a great You know career. what I thought about uh, Escalade when we played North Carolina State? Oh, man. The DJ big, Burns? Yeah. 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 I thought he, about that. You know, it's tough because he, he had that bucket that won the game, but... Mm-hmm. It's it's a fun watch when yeah. you when you're not playing against him, coaching yeah. against him. He's a fun guy to watch. Isn't oh it? yeah, he's he's full of energy too. And I was I was watching him warm up down there, and he was he was on ten the whole game. Yeah, he's got all the moves in his bag. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh-huh. For people that are listening to this show, they might not know. You know, it's first year with a new staff. Yeah, and you've been in the state for a long time, yeah. doing all kinds of stuff yes, in your coaching background. Just for those that are maybe new to you. Lay out for me how you ended up here yeah. and what your experience with coaching in this state at the AAU uh-huh. level and, and uh-huh. elsewhere has been. Yeah. So I first met Coach Shrewsbury at DePaul University with the W. Mm. And uh, me and him was on the same staff there at that time. And um, he mo- moved. He went on to be a big-time uh, coach at Notre Dame. And then I went on to be a, a little raggedy AAU basketball <laughs> coach. Uh, so uh, – I uh I got into the insurance industry on the uh on the all state agency in Indianapolis. Yeah. And and I did that because I, I believed in the industry and the power of renewal income. But also it gave me the flexibility to do what I really wanted to do was invest in kids. Hmm. So uh gave me a chance to have a little bit more freedom of time. Not not free time, just freedom to pick and choose when I want to pay the price to be successful. And uh so I, I, I loved it. I love coaching AU basketball. I've been coaching. I coached it for about 17 years, and my wife hates me every summer 
because you're gone every weekend and I'm always getting out of jail for the next couple months. <laughs> and then, uh, but just giving back to the kids, you know, I always tell people I joke and I don't live in a big old house, but I live in a big old house, got a hot wife, it's because of that basketball. <laughs> I've always wanted to give back to the game. Right. The game has been good for me. It paid for my college, it paid for my master's degree. I traveled around the world because of it. So I always want to give back to the game and that's what I always tried to do. You know, I hear AAU and growing up, you know, I'd probably play like a little bit like, you know, middle school, eight yeah. years and then change sports and whatnot. And like there's a sometimes a negative connotation mm-hmm. to AAU with the yeah. culture around it. And it's evolved over the last couple of decades. Mm-hmm. What was your experience in AAU? What are the really valuable parts of it? As you said, you, you felt you could have an impact with, mm-hmm. with young men and, and kids coming up. And then what are the things that maybe you're hoping to see change in that culture as well? That's a good question. So. You know, just like anything, there's bad high school coaches out there. Mm -hmm. There's terrible college coaches out there. Yeah. There's terrible AAU coaches out there. Um, AAU gets a bad rap and like, hey, yeah, it's just AAU basketball out there. It comes with negative connotation. Yeah. But, you know, for an individual like myself, we actually try to practice. You know, we try to practice. We try to install an offense. We try to teach fundamentals. Uh, We try to um, teach them life lessons. We made them, you know, we tried to run our program like, and I'm thinking about the last few years on the Nike sure. pro, on the Nike side or the Adidas side. We try to run it like a college organization. Okay. You know, we have scouting reports. We do personnel. We have strategy involved. We watch film. We make sure the kids brought their books on road trips. And uh, we had study hall on the road trips. You know, people missing classes during the week. We would try to have some type of repercussions like that. Okay. You know, you don't start this weekend. You know, we try to do the right thing. But there's bad apples with everything. But at the same time, it's it's high level basketball. You know, you get on that EYBL circuit, and every team over there has seven dudes going high major. Yeah. And the coaches do their work too. Yeah. And uh, when I first got into it, I used to think I was plus ten to start every game. Like, oh, look at that staff over. They ain't doing research. We we plus ten to start the game. <laughs> they didn't do their work, but that. The last few years in that EYBL circuit, like every coach was doing the same thing I was doing. A lot of people just giving back to the game and trying to make the game better. Yeah. What's the biggest then difference? And maybe you've just kind of laid it out too. The culture obviously is different than AAU, than Division One Notre Dame. What's right. the biggest culture shift or adjustment you've made coming to Notre Dame and working as an assistant here? Uh-huh. Um, people are people. I love people. So that's the people part, the recruiting part. That comes natural to me. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Um, The biggest uh, acclimation for me or learning opportunity for me was the technology part. Okay, yeah. Like sports code, huddle, uh, synergy. You know, there's all these different technology pieces that go into the recruiting. I'm not the recruiting, but the game plan. Yeah. So that was an acclimation for me. Thank God Grady Eifert's on the staff. I was talking to Grady and Trey about it, and, like, there's a learning curve they said yeah. to teach, I guess, players yeah. and even coaches, like, yeah. how to properly or be efficient with your time mm-hmm. watching film, right, mm-hmm. or taking in absolutely. advanced data, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, Grady, shout out to Grady Eifert. He's a bad boy. Mm-hmm. He, he really helped me through that that process and that transition. And then the second thing is just learning coach's system. Mm. Like, you got to understand, Coach Shrewsbury's different. Like, he's a top 1% basketball mind in the world. Okay. So for his system is it's so it's not super complex, but it's it's complex enough that where it's, you're not gonna just come in there and say, "Hey, we're gonna run this play," and then I just memorize the plays. It's not like that. Mm-hmm. It's a system, and uh, so that was an acclimation period for me as well. Okay, do your best then to explain to me someone that is not a one percent, but I think I understand the game pretty well. Not on your guys' level, but I can I can at least take in what you're saying. Yeah. Explain to me to what you can share. Yeah. What, what what's the system? It's it's not just your personnel. Just talk about defense. It's a defensive strategy. Okay. There's a defensive system. There's how we guard actions, and everybody's connected with that. Like if one person doesn't do the right thing, then it throws off the whole system. So it's it's very complex to the point where um, everybody has to be tied together in unity on the same accord. Mm-hmm. Why would you want to be on Coach True's staff? You mentioned you yeah. knew him from a from a while yeah. back. I've talked to you before about him, yeah. and you, you're very confident in his, you just obviously spoke highly of his abilities. Yeah. You're confident in him as a leader. Why'd mm-hmm. you wanna work with him here at Notre Dame? You know what, that's that's something that's near and dear to me. Like I did, I was living a good lifestyle. Yeah. It wasn't like I was knocking on the door and saying, I wanna be a college coach. Yeah. You know, I was living a good lifestyle. Um, 
I've had plenty of offers in the past to do it, but it's Coach Shrewsbury. Man, he's different. Mm -hmm. And I say that with the utmost respect. If I had a kid, he's playing for Coach Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. He's he's real on and off the court. Let me give you an example. Last week we were in Boston College, and me and him were just sitting there at a, uh, in the conference room. And we were just talking. He was asking me about my family. And we had this past week, the way our schedule lined up, we were off on Thursday. Check that. We was off on Friday, and we were off on Sunday. Yeah. And then he was asking me what we had at the crib, what was going on at the house with my kids, how's my wife doing? I said, well, this weekend she's a little stressed. You know, Aston has a game, Fort Wayne, uh, volleyball tournament in Fort Wayne. Cooper has seven on seven. He has basketball. Otis Roddy has this. She has that. He said, man, we're not going to do anything too crazy on Saturday. We got everybody here. He said, just stay home Saturday. Lock in with your family. I said, for real? And it was like Christmas for me. Mm -hmm. It just like all of a sudden I was in the best mood. You know, it's just like I had so much goodness and so much positive things to look forward to. So I saw like, you know, four, uh, check that, five, seven on seven games this weekend. I saw a bunch of basketball. Yeah. We watched football together. He helped me with the Miami scout a little bit personnel. Yeah. My son. So I just had a blast. So he's he's a real one off the court. Yeah. And like all the college coaches when I said, Hey, should I do this? You know, I called everybody. They were like, Hey, it's a no brainer. You're not just gonna go work for anybody. That's called shoes, man. Yeah. You know, he's a real one. You just can't go rock the whole family's boat for anybody. Right. I think that's a, a great story to share because I was talking to Coach Freeman on uh -huh. his football show earlier this year, yeah. and it was funny. Their bye week, they were all at that flag football game, yeah. uh, and the, you know, one of the reporters, of course, coaches their team. But it's tough to find that time during yeah. the season, and yeah. to your point, to have a coach that's yeah. aware enough to say, hey, yeah. we got you covered. Go spend some time with the family. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to shift gears a little bit. Yeah. The guest this week, player guest, J.R. Yeah. Konezny, uh -huh. uh, he, he was going to be with us right here, but I guess he's got <laughs> Italian class. All right, you know, last name Simeone, yeah. I have to respect if he's going to Italian class. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about J.R.'s game. It's your yeah. first year working with him, but he's yeah. a guy that people in the area obviously latch on to because he's local. Yeah. What are the biggest strides you've seen J.R. take this year, and what excites you about him? Because I watch him, and I get excited because I see him improving, it seems yeah. like, every month. You know, when you think of Jr., the first thing I think of is just how good of a person he is. Hmm. You know, not all cats walk in the room and the, and the lights go brighter when they walk in. Like, the room gets brighter when he walks in. Yeah. So he's just a beautiful person. He's somebody that you want to invest in, somebody that you like to coach, somebody that you want to get in the gym with and spend more time with him because he's such a good person. Uh, and then just talking about his game. Man, he flies around out there, doesn't he? Yeah. He cuts so hard. He Hits flies around, yeah. he rebounds, he follows the scouting report, the personnel, everything. He's a joy to coach. Yeah. Other guys on the staff, we talked about Coach Shrews, yeah. talked about Grady, you know, this group, yeah. you guys have been very welcoming to me and, and a lot of people around the program. Yeah. Uh, what have you liked about the other guys on the staff, getting to know them, working with them? Get, going back to Coach Shrewsbury, though, I got to tell you this, like <laughs> every time I'm on the court in practice, I'm just like staring at him like, dang, man. I wish I would've known that last year. <laughs> I wish I'd known that two years ago. I would've won peace jam. <laughs> like every time on the court, every day, it's you're like, learning. It's like a coach's clinic. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Like, how did I know this? Like, it's a humbling experience for me because mm -hmm. he's so talented. But uh, I had to say that it's like a coach's clinic every mm. day with Coach Shrewsbury. Um, so who did you mention? Well, you got, you got, you've talked about Grady already, uh -huh. but you got Coach Getter out there as well, Coach Fairley. So you think of Coach Fairley, you think about somebody who's uber detailed. Mm -hmm. Like he's super detailed in everything he does. He's serious about the game of basketball. He's yeah. taught me a lot. You think about Kyle Getter, then the first thing I say is like, he's like a duck. Like it's on the water and they're just rolling really, really smooth uh, out there. But underneath there, his feet's going so hard, he's getting so much stuff done. That's that's Kyle Getter. He gives us that championship DNA. Yeah, he's like, got yeah, it. Yeah, he's he's different. Yeah. yeah, we got so we got Ghost and we got Duck. Yeah, <laughs> we could have a, like a sitcom on our hands here. Yeah. Then you. So who else? We got uh yeah, Trey. My, my man Trey. He's Trey's a star. He's a star. It's the best way to describe him. He's got an unbelievable basketball mind offensive mind and he's unbelievable with player development yeah like the kids respond you can connect to him you mm -hmm. can tell when he was in here i talked to him he could yeah. really connect with yeah. those guys yeah. then we got pat yeah director of basketball operations yeah. 
and uh, I call him Project Pat. <laughs> okay. He yeah. he takes care of everything for us. All the projects, anything on campus, anything he takes, he puts out so many fires before it gets to us. Yeah. And like he's he's the MVP. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last one I got for you is just you know this year it's been fun to watch you guys. I think develop every month. I, I mm-hmm. talk to Coach Shrews before each game, yeah. and it comes up every now and then. And I think he's been making the point that like our goal is to basically look back each month and see that we got better. Yeah, and I think that's been happening. Uh, yeah. What excites you about the last couple months of this year to to try to finish doing that for this team? Um, I got back in town yesterday, probably about six o'clock, and Braden Shrewsbury had already been down there working out with a good lather. Uh, putting in work. Yeah. Uh, J.R. Kaniski was in there putting in work. Marcus Burton was in there putting in work. And then I left the office about 10.30 last night, and there was Braden Shrewsbury had left, ate, came back, and got another lather. Hmm. Marcus Burton was in there again. You know, uh, the big fella. Uh, uh, Kerry Booth. Kerry Booth. One of them, yeah. Yeah, Both Kerry, of them. Get yeah, in Kerry Booth yeah. in that lab. He's yeah. a morning guy, though. Okay. Yeah, he's so that's what excites me the most. We don't have to coach energy and effort. These dudes are serious about hooping. They're serious about their craft. Yeah. And um it's it's a fun group to invest. And all teams aren't created equal. We don't have any bad apples. We've all been on the teams where you want you don't want to sit by somebody on the bus or on the plane because they just bring you down. Yeah. We have zero bad apples. Okay. We got a bunch of good dudes that's fun to invest in. Right. I'm, then, I'm gonna keep an eye out and make sure that people are still sitting near me on the bus and <laughs> playing that. Maybe I'm the bad apple, I gotta be no, careful now. I always try to sit by you. No, you're you, good. You're I always good. try to sit close. I always <laughs> enjoy your conversation. You know how it is during the season, you hang around the assistant coaches some, so much, by the end of the conversation, you're finishing each other's sentences all yeah. the time. So I like sitting by you. And Mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. Get yeah. some other perspectives. Yeah. Well, Coach, I appreciate you stopping by. My pleasure. Great to have you on the show. We'll have you on again, I'm yeah. sure, whether it's this year or next year. But uh, best of luck the rest of the way. Thank you. I'm super grateful for your time. Thank you. All right. All right. We're now joined by a very special guest, Dwight Clay of Notre Dame Men's Basketball. Maybe one of the most notable shots in all of college basketball history. We'll get to the shot in a second, Dwight. First, I want to thank you uh, for joining us on this week's show. It is the 50th anniversary, of course, of the win over UCLA. I I just want to ask you, I don't want to make you feel too old, but can you believe it's been 50 years (laughs) since you knocked off the Bruins? Yeah, I can believe it's 50 years. Every time it gets cold, my knees... And my arthritis kicks in, <laughs> so I, I believe it's 50 years. <laughs> you know, we've got a lot of people that listen to this show of all different age ranges. I'm sure we've got people that listen to this show that were at the game. I'm sure we've got people that listen to the show that were not at the game that claim they were at the game. Uh, and then we've got some younger people that did not see the game live. they have got people my age that I grew up seeing the highlights all the time. And there's probably people younger than me that don't even know how big of a deal this game was. So I want you to try to just lay out for me, and maybe for those that were not around back then, how good was UCLA? How incredible was their 88-game win streak? And just how daunting was the task of beating a team like UCLA in 1974? Well, to begin with, you're dealing with Bill Walton, who hadn't lost a game <laughs> In his life, I don't think, you know, high school, college, 88 games in a row in in college. And, you know, they were number one. And, you know, people don't realize we were number two as well. So we had a good team. And, you know, it was almost like the East versus the West. We all we had all five Eastern ball players, and, And I'm quite sure they had all Western ball players. So, you know, the magnitude was huge, you know. Back then, you know, every game wasn't on ESPN like it is today. You know, Notre Dame, you know, kind of <clears throat> whet my appetite when I used to see Austin Carr every Saturday <laughs> on TV. Yeah. I said, if I could go, you know, play on Saturday every day, that's the school I want to go to. So that kind of, you know, whet my appetite for Notre Dame. <clears throat> but um, it was huge. You know, I you mentioned the the pomp and circumstance around. I think it was like Dick Enberg was there. Also, you, you said Bill Walton had lost. I saw a stat. I think he'd won 134 straight games since high school, 
like you mentioned. And I was reading an article about, I think it was written a few years back, about the game plan going into the game that Digger implemented. And it was to limit Bill Walton's touches. He only had 14 shots in the game. And he made 12, but you held the rest of the team to like 40% shooting. So going into the game, just what was the mindset and and how did you guys try to execute against the Bruins? Well, you know, at practice, you know, we, we brought out broomsticks, <laughs> and, you know. So to shoot over the broomsticks, you know, on the offensive side and on the defensive side, you know, we had Shoemate try to front him and, you know, we shaded, you know, for the weak side for the backup. And then we played tough man-to-man defense, you know. Very seldom did we play a zone, you know. We had quality, you know, ball players, and we played tough man-to-man defense. So, you know, the game started out in their favor, but, you know, we always thought we could measure up and, and come back and, and tie this game up. You know, you mentioned that because I'm, I was watching the highlights back. You're down at one point seventy to 65 you obviously end the game on a run to, to win. Was there ever a time in that game, again, you're playing a team that's won 88 in a row, where whether it's in a huddle or looking at each other, like doubt crept in? Or was it always, even when you're trailing late in the final minutes, hey, we're going to find a way to make the plays to make this happen? Well, I can't, I can't you know, <laughs> say we didn't have a little doubt <laughs> when you're down like that. But uh, Coach made a strategic move. He put Ray Martin in the game. And when Ray Martin comes in the game, we always initiated a, a strong press. So we started pressing this team, and they started turning the ball over. And then, you know, once the team started turning the ball over, that gets gets you excited somewhat. So that just started us to, you know, press them a little harder and harder. And next thing we know, it was a three, two-point game. Okay, so let's talk about that now. Because when it's a one-point game, you're the guy. The ball ends up in your hands, and you take and make what – you know, I, I've been reading up on it to get ready for this, and people still call it maybe the biggest regular season college basketball shot of all time. I, I heard so I was reading an article. It's basically Christian Leitner in the postseason. Then it's you. I mean, it's one of the biggest shots in all of the history of college basketball. So when the ball finds your hands, do I? I need to know what goes through your head, and how did you have the confidence to take and make the biggest shot? Well, I'll take you back a little bit. Um, ESPN. <clears throat> rated that they had a documentary and they rated our game the number four game of all time as far as ESPN was concerned. But to to be honest with you, we practiced that shot <laughs> daily. And when teams play a zone against us, I played the corner. I would go from corner to corner and Gary Brokaw played the point. And you know, my corner jump shot was, you know, somewhat deadly. I can remember we was playing South Carolina and they were ranked pretty high, and <clears throat> they initiated a tough zone, and Gary played the, the point, and I played the corner, and I hit about three or four jump shots from the corner, and they came out of that zone, and then Dantley and Shoemate went to work inside. So that wasn't you know, too far off for me to hit that shot in the corner. We had practiced that shot. So the shot goes in, and then you guys are winning, and you still have to escape, you know, a few cracks at it on the other end. I, I watch the highlights still. Bill Walton gets the ball in a pretty good spot, Dwight, and, and, and I'm thinking, Bill Walton, he's not missing this. Every time I watch it, I think it's going in. Uh, what's going through your head when UCLA gets that final, and not just one, they get the rebound, two, uh, to, to see those shots miss, just what's going through your head in that final sequence? <laughs> you know, I – I kind of joke with some of my friends about that shot. You know, when they took that shot, I always say UCLA had a tip drill. <laughs> they would line up and tip drill. I think about six or seven of them lined up and everybody had a tip drill at the basket, but it never went in. You know, that was a good shot that Walton took. And, um, but she made forced him out a little bit yeah. and that made it even difficult. And then Myers had a shot and Turkovich had a tip at it. And it was just incredible. I just think we were meant to win that game because, you know, that tip drill, sometimes the last person always tips it in. To, to, to your point, <laughs> you watch the replay, you're like, okay, maybe Notre Dame is supposed to win this because they got a lot of good looks at the rim. Uh, then it's just Bedlam on the floor. Everyone storms the court. It looks like an amazing scene, kind of what you dream of uh, when you decide to, to play high-level college basketball. What do you remember? Of course, the great photos. What do you remember about being on the floor 
as really mayhem ensues after you guys end the 88 game winning streak? Back then, that wasn't the norm of rushing the court. You know, it was it was kind of new to us as well. You know, especially, you know, I was <clears throat> around the top of the key when all of that was going on and the crowd came on the court and I was, you know, my mom's came to the game as well. She was sitting in the first section in there and I ran through all that crowd and gave her a hug and told her that shot was for her. But um, the rest of my teammates, I think they got caught in the mist. <laughs> But, you know, that wasn't the norm rushing the court back then. So it was exciting. I have to ask about something else I read, and it's that after the dust settles at the end of the game, is it true that you guys went to South Dining Hall and received a standing ovation? Yes, that's true. That's true. Because, um, you know, we were, <clears throat> most of us lived on the South Campus, Fisher Hall and, you know, that end of the campus. And they knew us fairly well because they would hold the they would hold the dining hall open for us after practice. Digger would hold us to practice so long, you know. I still got that habit of taking a quick shower and, and, and running out the shower and, and putting my clothes on so we could make the soft dining hall. We would get there and they would hold the table open for us, um, the cafeteria open for us. And um, so they knew most of us. And when we got there, you were corrected. They gave us a standing ovation. Now, I have to ask you a question then, because I ask this to everyone that comes on the show that's attended Notre Dame. I assume if there was a South Dining Hall, there was North Dining Hall as well at that time. So That's correct. So we ask everyone to vote, which is your favorite dining hall? Now, maybe you're biased because you got an ovation at South, but were you a North <laughs> or a South guy? What's your preference when it comes to the two dining halls? Well, I'm still going to go with the South Dining Hall. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see why. So, because you because they, kept the food, they kept the food hot for us <laughs> and, <it's been laughs> and we got there. Uh, I wanted to know, too, about, you know, 50 years, it, it's a long time, but, but teams, obviously, and a team like that, I imagine, bonded for life. Just how do you and your teammates stay in touch now? How often do you guys reminisce about the game? What's the dynamic like now with, with everyone 50 years later? Well, a few of us, we talk often, you know, Ray Martin is like the conduit of every, of all the get togethers, you know, he, he's the centerpiece, me, Ray, Gary Brokaw and Duck, Donald Williams, who he wasn't on that team, but he played with us his freshman year and I was a senior. And, uh, just recently, um, uh, Dantley, he, he didn't join the fray, I guess after he started he didn't count all of his money now. He, you know, he don't have to worry about his money now. So he comes in and talks with us sometimes. But the three of us, we talk um, constantly. And Ray Martin, he keeps in touch with Shoemate, and Shoemate gets into the fray as well sometimes. But Brokaw, myself, and Ray Martin, we talk all the time. Well, Dwight, I want to take a quick break. I want to come back and get our from the Irish question. All right. All right, it's now time for our From the Irish segment presented by TireRack.com. As always, we have a question from a listener. Dwight, here's your question. It's from Cody O, okay, from Bourbon, Indiana. They ask, Cody says, did your life change after snapping the winning streak? And also, how often do you think about that shot 50 years later? Of course, my Cody, of course my life changed. I became... Uh... You know, a trivia question, <laughs> so to speak. And I tell people at least twice a week, I'm asked that about that shot and that game. Like you said, when we started, some people say they were there. And a lot of people say they've seen it on TV and, you know, what have you. But twice a week since 1976, 77, I've been asked about that shot ever since then. Well, Dwight, I appreciate you joining us on this show. Uh, again, as someone that was not alive back then, I know it is one of the biggest shots in the history of the sport. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Of course, everything you've done for Notre Dame basketball, people here take great pride in what you and that team did, uh, and we appreciate you joining the show. No problem. Thank you for having me. That does it for this week's edition of Wake Up the Echoes presented by TireRack.com. Thanks once again to head coach Micah Shrewsbury. 
Ryan Owens, J.R. Konezny, and of course, Dwight Clay for making some time to talk about that great game 50 years ago. Remember, if you can, download, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasting content. And additionally, we'd love it if you could watch along on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. If you want to ever ask one of our special guests a question, go to fightingirish.com slash wake up. That's where you can submit a question that hopefully can be read on this show. Until next time, we'll talk to you next week on Wake Up the Irish.